Every evening we have chants in honor of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, recollecting their virtues before we meditate. Because it's a good way of uplifting the mind, or as the text say, gladdening the mind. They put you in the right mood to meditate these recollections. You think about the kind of person the Buddha was, the person who found this path. And you think about how good the Dharma is and how noble the example of his noble disciples. And of course, each of us will have particular stories or particular aspects of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha that we find especially inspiring. And it's good that you read up the life of the Buddha. You read the Dharma. You learn about the noble disciples, both in the time of the Buddha and in more recent times, as a way of getting, giving energy to your path. And then you can choose the incidents that you find inspiring. And when you find that the meditation is starting to get dry or repetitive or you're reaching a plateau, or you've been on a plateau for a while, you can call on these things to help. Not that the Buddha is going to come down and help you, but your memory of his example, your memory of the Dharma, your memory of the example of the Sangha. will be uplifting to your practice. One of the things I've always found inspiring about the Buddha was his conviction that human effort can make a difference. And that's important. He wanted to make a difference. All too often we hear that the teaching is about acceptance. and. There are some things you have to accept, but you basically accept principles of how things work and how things don't work. But then you try to use those principles. In the case of the Buddha, he used those principles to put an end to suffering. He saw that the things that he was pursuing were all subject to aging, illness, and death. He himself was subject to aging, illness, and death, so there was nothing really worthwhile about the pursuit, because it was all going to end in nothing. What if there was something that didn't grow old, didn't age, didn't get ill, didn't die, didn't change? If there were such a thing, wouldn't that be worth pursuing? And he wasn't 100% sure that there was such a thing, but he figured that He'd much rather give up his life in the pursuit of that idea, rather than just let the possibility sort of hang there in the air without being tested. This is another aspect of the Buddha that's really admirable, his willingness to test things, and particularly his actions. He'd notice there was something wrong with the state of his mind, something not quite satisfactory. And so he'd ask himself, what was, he, what was he doing that was creating that state of mind? Why was he acting in a way that wasn't really giving satisfaction? Could there be another way? And as he said, there were two qualities that motivated his path. One was lack of contentment with skillful qualities, and the other was relentless effort. In other words, he never let himself rest content with how well his mind was, unless it was really, really, really good. If there's any smidgen of stress or suffering or anything less than ideal in the state of his mind, he wanted to figure out how to get past it. But always the question was, what am I doing? And that question started with very basic things in terms of the words he was speaking and the actions he was doing with his body. 
all the way into the movements of the mind. And it's through that testing and questioning and experimenting again and again and again that he finally found awakening. And he made his mistakes. We know about those six years he spent with austerities. That's a sign of his admirable character that he was willing to recognize at the end of six years. He thought to himself, there's never been anyone who has devoted himself to austerities more than he had. And there are people who, if they had come to that point in their practice, probably would have just stayed right there. They wouldn't have wanted to admit they would made a mistake. After all, they devoted all that time. And what keeps you going for six years like that, but it's not a sense of pride in your ability to do, handle these difficulties. It would have been all too easy just to hang on to the pride. But he realized that that wasn't going to get him anywhere. He realized that he was going to have to change his practice and disappoint a lot of people. who really believed in austerities. So he's willing to make the sacrifice. But again, it always came back to, what am I doing that, that's not quite satisfactory yet, and what can I do to change it and make it better? There was one alternative that he never explored, and that was the idea that human effort can't do anything. In fact, after his awakening, it was one of the few issues that he would actually go out and debate people on. Most of the debates we see in the canon are people coming to the Buddha and taking issue with something he said. It's very rare that he goes out and asks people, I understand that you've been saying X. Is, this, is that really true? And they would say, yes, it's true. And then he'd argue with them. But the cases all had to do with the power of human action, either people who said that Actions had no consequences, or those who said that you don't really act on your own, everything you experience is the result of either some impersonal principle or something that you did in the past that you can't change, or some god has decided that this is the way should, things should be. So everything the Buddha taught and exemplified in his actions had to do with the importance of action, that it really does make a difference what you choose to do. And if you look at the way he talks about discernment, and the beginning level is when he's talking to his son, teaching about the basic principles of the practice. He says, you look into your actions as you look into a mirror. You cleanse your mind by cleansing your actions. So you focus on your intentions, what you're doing, what you expect to gain out of what you're doing. And then while you're acting, you try to see what immediate results you're getting, and then when the action is done, you look at the long-term results. If you saw that it was a mistake, if it caused affliction either to yourself or to someone else or to both, you'd resolve not to repeat that mistake. If you could, you'd talk it over with someone who's more experienced on the path. And even when you get into the more subtle levels of practice, it's all a question of action, fabrication, sankara. These are intentional actions. Like when you're focusing on the breath right now. The breath, the in and out breath, is called the bodily sankara. It's one of the few processes in the body that you actually can exert some conscious control over. And it shapes your experience of the whole rest of the body. There's verbal fabrication, the things you say to yourself as you're watching the breath. You focus on one aspect of the breath, then you evaluate how things are going. Is the breath comfortable? Is it not? Is your focus solid or is it not? Is it too light? Is it too heavy? Could you be focusing someplace else? Could the breath be doing something else, going in a different direction? These are things you have some control over. And he 
and you find that the breath is going well, how do you maintain it? And as you maintain it, how can you maximize the benefits that come from it? And this relates to mental fabrication, feelings and perceptions, the labels you place on things in the body. You see this is most clearly as you're working with the breath energies in the body, parts of the body that maybe you never thought of as having anything to do with the breath. Try labeling them as breath. There's still breath, there's breath that goes around in circles, there's breath that comes in, goes out, all kinds of breath energy in the body. And if you change your perception of how you sense the body and what it is that you're actually sensing when you sense the inside of the body, try to look at it through the lens of being breath energy of one kind or another. You find it really does change the way you relate to the meditation, the way you relate to your body, the ability of the mind to settle down and have a sense of broad but focused awareness in the body. And as for the feelings, you notice there are feelings of pleasure, feelings of not pleasure. And how can you maximize the pleasure? By the way you focus on the breath, by the way you breathe. All of these, these things are issues of fabrication. As the Buddha said, we suffer because we fabricate our experience, not out of whole cloth. We fabricate it out of potentials that come from our past karma. But our present actions have a huge role in shaping the way we experience things. And most often we do it out of ignorance, which is why we suffer. But if you bring knowledge to these fabrications, it can bring an end to suffering. So it's all about action. starting from the things you do and say as you engage with other people, to the things you think in your ordinary, everyday life, to the things you think when you're meditating, the things you notice, the things you perceive and feel when you meditate. All of these have an element of fabrication, i.e. there's an element of intention in them. And it's understanding that and wanting to fabricate well, to the point where you can bring the mind to something that's unfabricated. That's the skill of the path. That's what discernment is all about. So when you think about the Buddha's life and the example he set, it can't help but bring you back into the present moment, what you're doing right here and right now. Because everything in his life was about the importance of action, the potential of action, how far your actions and efforts can take you. And you think about his unwillingness to settle for second best or whatever that's not first best. That gives you the energy and gives you the, the motivation to try your first best. Each time you breathe in, each time you breathe out. That's the kind of reflection that can gladden the heart and give energy to your practice.